good afternoon, everybody. And now for something completely different, really, because you saw the three papers we had before the tea break, <coughs> and they were all about volunteers going out and actually physically engaging with the sites. Now, this is something completely opposite of the sector because this is all about digital and virtual volunteering. You will all have found postcards. So now you're going to find out what those are all about. I presume everybody's familiar with the National Heritage List for England in this room. We've got nearly 400,000 entries on it, mainly listed buildings, but also scheduled monuments, registered parks and gardens, and registered battlefields. But it's got a bit of a problem. The older list entries are often very brief, and I've got an example there of one from 1979, which for the, for the list description is entirely L-plan, yellow brick barn with thatched roof. Now, how is that adequate to enable any curator working on a case of the building, anybody considering a grant, to actually explain what's it significant, why is it important? You can't even look at that and visualise, really, what it looks like. So, those list descriptions, and we have an awful lot of them, don't meet current standards. And they haven't been kept up to date with the latest knowledge or research. There's no, Im there's no images. Everybody wants to see pictures. That's one of the main comments we get back about the NHLE is there's no pictures on it. We at Historic England don't have sufficient resources to go through and systematically revise the older entries. And also, because it's a statutory record where things have to be approved by the DCMS, we, it's a slow process to update listings. And also the NHLE website. It's a very much an old-fashioned website and it broadcasts information to people. Whereas modern websites now are very much interactive and that is what users expect. They expect to have information that they can engage with. And being a government body, we have to meet the government's digital agenda. And there's tremendous potential. The National Heritage List um, averages around 170,000 visits every month. And pages relating to listing account for about 60% of the visits to the HE website. And that graph at the top, the top line, shows um, visits to the, um, to the NHLE compared with the other web resources that English Historic England is responsible for. So it's clearly responsible. If you're wondering why there's a sudden dip there, that covers the Christmas period, and not many, not many people go searching listed building information over, over Christmas. We know there's a vast amount of additional knowledge out there from researchers, both amateur and professional, and we want to do something that engages everybody. And you may have seen the news story with which we launched Historic England a year ago, which was the stat that 93% of the population live in one mile of a protected site or building. And lastly, we've already heard a lot about it. I've just got a page from some research which Historic England shared. People care about this stuff. They care about the historic buildings around them. The solution. Has everybody heard of the concept of crowdsourcing? A few nods. Really, it comes from really, um, the first person to really talk about this was an American academic uh, called Clay Shirky. That's in one of his books there. And he called it The Cognitive Surplus. And the subtitle of that book is New Technology to makes consumers into collaborators. Consumers, you might think that's very, sounds very commercial, but actually, it's king of consumers in the widest sense. They're people who are consuming our information about the historic environment. So we want to tap into the research of others. And we want to have great engagement in the list by the users. If people can engage with the website, then they're more likely to value uh, because they understand and they feel a better empathy with the buildings that are all around them and then they'll help them, all of us protect them as a result. And we really also want to engage new audiences 
And that, again, is very much about bringing the website up to date, making it a two-way process. Uh, it's not the first use of crowdsourcing um, in Heritage, but it's a little, bit, little bit different to what some others have done. A few other examples. There's the MicroPasts platform you might have heard of, which is backed by the British Museum and UCL, and many projects can get uh, on that to help do their research online. You heard earlier a bit about Canmore from um, from Historic Environment Scotland. I nearly called it the, 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 the Scottish Commission. <laughs> but it was originally a Scottish Commission site. Users can actually update information. You heard a bit about how they fill out a form and the information then gets checked and it gets uploaded as new records. There's the Know Your Place project with uh, the Historic Environment record in Bristol, which is an absolutely fantastic project. I really recommend you to go and have a look at that, particularly their map interface. And recently, the Church Heritage record went live from the Church of England with all the information about their historic buildings online, and that has a commenting facility, but that, conversely, isn't being checked. The one difference between what we're doing and all of those is they aren't statutory records. We here have the National Heritage List for England, these all sites with uh, legal protection. So there's a lot of nerves, so we can't just open it up and say, say what you think. That would be just a little bit too radical. There's one example of uh, another place which has done something similar, and only one I could find in all the research I did for this project, which was the Victorian Heritage Database, and that's Victoria in Australia. Their heritage, their, their heritage database of all their historic buildings is available for people to comment, add photographs. Although, actually looking through the entries on that, they haven't got a huge number of contributions from users, or at least not at present. And I've had some conversations with them about that. <coughs> so, what we're doing is we have to have user-generated content which is separate from the list entry itself. So that there people can be no confusion that what they're then seeing is part of the legal description. And the DCMS are, very, uh, are rightly quite insistent on that. And also we are moderating content. We're not checking the accuracy, we're checking it meets our terms and conditions. Just a bit about use, potential users. Obviously for a session like this I've got to put the community and voluntary sector right at the top and uh, I've been I've been talking to and engaging with some archaeology societies I've got a buildings recording group taking part in our testing uh, we're very keen to get civic societies involved the amenity societies are very keen on this and there's a lot of individuals out there not part of groups who've done their own particular research maybe they might just be into one building all the local buildings of their area or a Pacific um, topic like mills. We want to engage with the, curation, the curatorial side, HER officers. We've got some HERs involved. Uh, Algae are very positive about this project. People working in development control. Um, I spoke to a meeting of conservation officers a couple of weeks ago, got very good feedback from them as well. And local archives have a lot of material that they can share and link through this. And then, obviously, the contractor side. They do work on these sites and buildings. Where are we? We are engaging a semi-public beta test at the moment. And what we mean by semi-public is anybody can see the results going live online, but we're only working with specific people we've invited to take part and help us test. But if anybody came to us and said, oh, I'd like to, help, I'd like to uh, help test, then we'll give them a special access code and they can help us out. And in fact, if any of you want to, please feel free, uh, drop me a line and we'll, we'll set you up. But we haven't got long left uh, to go with the beta test now. Although we are well, we are developing at the moment. We are using something called the Agile methodology for project management. And that means we ha you don't define what you're finally producing at the start. It develops as you go, which means we can carry on testing and we can carry on responding to the things our test users are finding whilst we're still building the system. Very brave way of working, some people are saying. I, I'm, I've, I've, I'm a convert, I really like it. 
At the moment, we've got 50 registered users, uh, some Historic England staff, we've got some HR officers, some conservation officers, we've got a couple of local history societies involved, we've got a, uh, the uh, local buildings recording group, and some local historians, one of which is one of whom is particularly active, who he thinks he's a He's really enthusiastic about this project, and you'll see some of his contributions in a minute. Um, so far, as of uh, yesterday, we'd published 748 user contributions since uh, we began the beta test. 724 of those have had photographs with them, and that's 747 photographs in total, which, I, which I'm really impressed with. I, I, it's, I think that's a testament to how keen people are to engage with this and how easy to use the system that we've built is. So, I mentioned our, our keenest contributor. That's one of his, I'm not going to read all that out, but that's some of his detailed research on the local building. And he's actually put the references to the books where he's got that from in at the end, which is always really useful, because what this is, is an indication there's more information that's in the list and we want people, and there's more to research if you're interested in that building and where you can find it. There's one of his photographs of the same building. Two entries there from a local historic environment record, together with links to their online records. One from Coventry City Council and one from Buckinghamshire Historic Environment Record. <coughs> and we are getting some truly fantastic photographs. Those ones of uh, God Revy Lighthouse in Cornwall, which was the inspiration for Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse. It's an interesting one. This the top comment there tells us that the building that was a pub isn't anymore, and it's been turned into housing and renamed Gosling Court. Now that's actually the sort of change that the DCMS does allow us to make. So what we've done is we've dealt with it under the, our minor, what are called a minor amendments procedure. And we've posted a note back to say, thanks for bringing that to our attention. And we've been able to action that one. Anything more major, we'd get back to a person and say, that would need a full amendment. You need to fill out as quite a detailed form. Um, but the one at the bottom is somebody who's done a bit of map regression saying on oh, the, you know, the listed boathouse, however, the map changed shape and it wasn't on a map of this date, etc. So again, that's something else that might need to be researched. This does represent a bit of a cultural shift. And it's, the culture of historic England is different from the culture of the old English heritage. As I say, we're opening up a statutory record to the public. We're accepting that others know more about a lot of these buildings than we do. We're being very open. It's also, if you looked at um, the planning the show Historic England published, there was a lot in there about partnership working and volunteering. This is virtual volunteering, and I'm very keen that we keep referring to these people who register <coughs> and use this as volunteers. I, I see them very much as uh, volunteers, not people just leaving a comment on a website. And personally, I, I'm very committed to this. We, I've been talking about using digital resources to dem democratise her um, heritage for a long time. Uh, I published an article uh, about what curators are doing along these lines, uh, criticising uh, Laura Jane Smith's notion of the authorised heritage discourse back in 2005, so it's great to actually be managing a project myself, which is doing exactly this. And we're also using virtual volunteering elsewhere. Uh, particularly, you might have heard of the Pride of Place project we have running. And we did have some a consultation on underrepresented heritage, which you can see the report from at the bottom there. And in that, one of the things we said we would do would be to open up listing to more inclusion of information from the her heritage of groups which were underrepresented, black and ethnic minority heritage, for example. And we're now going to work with those groups and use this as a way for them to feed into us information about from their heritage about these buildings. And also a cultural shift. 
people keep getting a lot of good feedback everywhere I'm going talking about this, but everybody then says, you're being very brave. <laughs> so, um, I also want to make a bit of a call for help. A lot of you will work with community projects. Please share information about what we're doing. We're going to be launching in June and encourage the groups you work with to sign up. Group um, Societies, for example, could have a organisational account where it appears the name of their buildings group, recording group or archaeological society, or people can sign up as individuals for this. We'd like you to contribute what you know from your research. And of course you can link to any resources you've got online yourself. And if you're finding the new information that you're seeing about these buildings and sites useful, please get back to us and tell us how useful it was and what, what, in what way you've used it. And you know, just keep pe telling people in your area about enriching the list. But I'm sure you're going to say, what's in it for me? And hopefully you'll think, if you engage with this, it'll have your names on it, whether your company name, your society, your name, your personal name, and so it's good publicity for you. Any links you add will draw visits to your <coughs> website. It's providing more information for you to make use of, and all the photographs that are being uploaded um, are variant on Creative Commons, so you can make use of them yourself providing you attribute them to the person who took them. And hopefully it will help you with any community projects you're running. If you want to know more, probably the best thing is to, I don't want any feedback, email the enriching the list at Historic England. Uh, if, you do, if you do email me, I will, I will pass it on because the people in the team who are doing the moderation are logging all of the feedback we get. What I'm going to try and do now is, it really is the brave part of, the demo, of this because I'm going to try and do a live system demonstration. This is where things go and go wrong and there was a problem with our website earlier so hopefully it's going to be right. Now here's an, here is an entry on the NHLE and it's for the Arch of Remembrance in Leicester. I'm sure you've all walked past it. It's the great big war memorial just down the road. And this is a very good list description. It's very long because it was up dated last year as part of our programme <laughs> on war memorials for the March of the centenary of the, end of the First World War. So, a lot of information there, but you get down to what, now you see this, your contributions, and that's our, our legal disclaimer bit that we have to have. So, as I said, there can be no, end of official listing, there can be no doubt that you are leaving the official listing. And there's nobody logged in, and there's no comments. But I'm going to imagine now, what I'm doing is I was walking past and I thought, oh, what's that? And the NHLE is mobile enabled, so I got out my phone, I searched the NHLE, I read all about the war memorial, and I went, oh, what a shame they haven't got a photograph of it. I know what. I'll take one. So I'm going to go add image, choose it from my photo library, select my photo. I really am doing this, honest. Here you go. <laughs> it's loading, it's there there's so much detail I don't need to say anything more because it's got such a good description I'm just going to add image now as I said things are being validated Go on. however for the purposes of this demonstration I have been set to bypass bypass validation <laughs> so <laughs> mind you if any, if any of the if any of the team decided to reject my posts, I wouldn't be very happy with them. OK, that looks like it's done. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly refresh this page. Oh, look. One contribution from Martin Newman. And there, that's not the best photo in the world, but that's the Arch of Remembrance, and that is now live on, online. If anybody looks at this description for that, from now on, they will see that photograph. How am I doing for time? Yeah, because I could do. Oh, okay, well, I, I I could do some more sign in here and upload some comments from you, but I think we're running out of time for that, aren't we? Okay, but I will quite happily take any questions. <laughs>